How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. We're all made of DNA. Hello, you're listening to DNA Today, a genetics podcast and radio show. I'm your host, Kira Janine. DNA Today informs on what's happening in the genetic world. And during my broadcast here, I'm educating you, the public, on genetic and health topics through event coverage and interviews. My guests typically include genetic counselors, researchers, doctors, patient advocates, and professors. And today on the episode, my guests are author Laura Keeger and her son, Dr. Alexander Keeger. Now, Laura chronicles her family's courageous and century-long struggle with a rare genetic cancer syndrome in her book, Summer's Complaint. And Dr. Alexander Keeger provides an afterword in the book, um, providing his perspective as both a family member and physician. So thanks so much, guys, for coming on the show and kind of sharing your experience. Thank you for having us. Yep, thank you. So I want to start out with what hereditary cancer syndrome your family has and to give the audience kind of a general idea of how many people it affects in the U.S. I'll take the question to start. The condition is called familial adenomatous polyposis. Um, we refer to it as FAP. That'll probably be what we use throughout the, the interview. Um, it's characterized by the development of uh, hundreds to thousands of polyps in the colon, which are also called adenomas. Um, and these, with time, become cancerous. And um, the issue is that, you know, by the time someone reaches the age of, you know, their late 30s, 40s, they're almost uh, all of them have developed cancer at that time. So it's a condition that uh, ab absolutely requires removal of the colon during someone's lifetime in order to preserve life and prevent cancer. Um, it's a very rare disease. It's actually about one to nine people in every 100,000 in the United States. And about 1 in 8,000 births annually in the United States are people with FAP. Um, our family uh, has been dealing with the genetic form of FAP, but surprisingly, about 30% of cases of FAP derives from de novo mutations, meaning that in the germline from uh, the parents, the mutation occurs spontaneously, and you have an offspring or a child with FAP, um, but there's no prior family history of it. Um, the inheritable form is actually passed down through an autosomal dominant pattern, um, and that's because the gene is essentially a uh, tumor suppressor, <laughs> and if you get one bad allele, you have decreased tumor suppression, and all it takes is for another mutation or a couple mutations to accumulate in order for a cell to become cancerous. Is there anything so you want that's where the that's where the predisposition kind of comes into play that um, if you have this genetic mutation, then you're predisposed to then inherit cancer because out of, you know, your two alleles, one is already mutated. Right. So you're almost, it just puts you that much closer. It makes the cells that much more susceptible uh, when the cells do accumulate mutations, which cells do in the colon throughout anyone's lifetime. Um, the body has less of a chance to, to eliminate those cancerous and precancerous cells because they've already you know, been pushed so close to that transformation because their underlying genetics are already um, predisposing them to that. And you mentioned that there can be the de novo mutation, which means that someone doesn't have a family history of this happening, but it kind of uh, just randomly happened to them that they have this mutation. But there's also the inherited form where it's been passed down from different family members, which is what you have in your family. Um, how many of your family members have inherited this mutated gene, which we can name as the APC gene, that have caused their FAP? So this is Laura. Um, uh, my mother, who was born in 1930, grew up in North Dakota. She was an only child, and her mother, Cecilia, had passed away from colorectal cancer at the age of 32 when my mother was six. My mom married and had eight kids, including me, and uh, we're kind of a classic boomer family. The oldest child in our family uh, was born in 1948 and the youngest in 1964. So there was kind of a 16-year spread there for the eight kids. Of these children, five of my siblings had or have FAP, and three did not inherit the gene mutation. 
Um, among my siblings and I, we had a total of 21 children, seven of which inherited the gene mutation. So um, it's kind of taken its toll, uh, you know, of the eight kids and, you know, um, being um, inherited by a number of the grandchildren. It, uh, it was quite the, uh, the dark shadows, you might say, over, cast over the family. And it just must be so hard to, you know, in some families, you have one person that's affected by a rare disease and, and just how hard that is for the family. But I can't imagine having so many family members affected and, you know, of their cancers overlapping with each other and, you know, being there to support each other. But with so much happening, that must be very difficult. I think it's a strange mirror that we're holding up both um, to ourselves and, and at each other seeing how others are doing, um, talking about what we're going through. Um, and of course, there's some fear there. And what are some of the preventative surgeries that your family members have gone through in order to, um, to decrease their risk of developing cancer? Um, Alex, you mentioned that you know the risk of cancer is so high with this um, hereditary cancer syndrome. Um, what are kind of the options to limit risk? Right. So there has been a little bit of variability, especially among the people in our family. <clears throat> a few people have opted to have only a part of their colon taken out and to preserve a small segment um, so that they would have to get that screened with endoscopy on a regular basis. But it would sort of give them a little more comfort as far as, um, you know, being able to have a regular schedule with the bathroom. Um, ultimately, you know, in order to totally remove the risk of colon cancer, the entire colon has to be taken out. And then a new sort of res reservoir has to be made out of small intestine, and that's called a J-pouch. And that's a surgery that happens in two parts. And um, more commonly nowadays, that's done in the, usually in the teenage years and in some cases even younger. Um, but it's a lot for someone to go through. And um, understandably, we've had family members who have opted more for the sort of the subtotal option. Um, the you know the more fear the, the the option that people are are more fearful of is having the resection done and then not being able to maintain continence and having to be sort of um, left with a with a bag you know for the remainder of their life and fortunately that's a, a more more of a rare thing uh, with modern day surgery but it is a fear that people have among the other fears related to having abdominal surgery. It's a lot to go through not only the surgeries but also to have this kind of different lifestyle almost that you're a little bit different from other people. Um, I want to take a little bit of a step back and ask you to speak a little bit about classic FAP and the colon cancer risk there as opposed to other forms. So uh, my family um, has been identified as having the classic FAP. And what that means, at least to us, is that we have the polyps in the colon that show up, but we don't have, uh, for some reason, we don't have what's considered profuse polyposis. So our, our polyp burden is primarily in the hundreds of polyps when it's first discovered, maybe a fewer than that, maybe 50. But there are other FAP families who suffer from profuse polyposis where the polyp count is in the thousands, and it's found at a very young age. It's um, it's unfortunate. I did have a reader reach out to me through my website, and she let me know that she comes from an FAP family, and she had her J-pouch surgery at the age of 11, and her cousin had J-pouch surgery at the age of 9. And she said it was really hard to talk about, and within their own family, they don't talk much about it. So she goes out online, and she reaches out to people that might be able to help her deal with um, this, this gene mutation. And the nice thing is, um, part of what she said reaching out to me was, I felt like re when I was reading your book, I was part of your family. And that was really nice. That is just so powerful to know that sharing your own family story really can positively affect other people to say, hey, our family's going through this, and there are other families out there, not just in the U.S., but the world that are experiencing this. And it's very, you know, specific circumstances that you experience that other FAP families are really in the same boat with that. That would be correct. Um, globally, I can't imagine, um, you know, I'm obviously we experience, we express the gene 
differently than others do. Um, that that was a hard lesson as I as I grew up and and got older. But um, we do share some common commonalities in relation to how we're dealing with it and and how we view life and how we view you know, how we spend our time. And um, that's important. Certainly. And I want to kind of highlight that this hereditary cancer syndrome was a little bit different than other hereditary cancer syndromes in terms of um, the risk level. Many hereditary cancer syndromes increase someone's risk for, you know, developing cancer, but FAP increases this risk to almost 100%, which is kind of unheard of. Do we know why the penetrance, which is what we call that, is so high with FAP compared to these other syndromes? I don't know that it's been um, perfectly delineated as to why it's 100%. I think, you know, on a, on a cellular level, you have these cells that are already close enough to becoming cancerous because they already have one, um, they're already missing one of their tumor suppressor genes. And these cells live in an organ that is constantly being exposed to toxins and other things that cause the cells to develop new mutations. Um, and, you know, with time and just statistically with the number of cells, you know, in the colon, um, and as, and with age, it just becomes an an inevitability. Um, and that's, um, really the best explanation that I could come up with. Um, I'm sure that if you, if you had a million cases, maybe somebody would break the trend and, you know, not develop cancer. But as far as the, how to manage expectations and how to manage, um, the disease process, it's, uh, it's treated as if it's a hundred percent. And that's certainly the, you know, the right way to go. And we mentioned earlier that, um, onset is typically a little earlier than other types of hereditary cancer syndromes, which kind of goes with that high penetrance. What is the typical age people with FAP develop cancers? Um, I mean, it's always a spectrum and some people will develop cancers at a younger age. The, the median age for untreated um, patients with FAP is 39 for the development of colon cancer. But having the surgery is, you know, a big decision for people and and they want to do it at a time when it's not as disruptive to their life. So a lot of times people are opting to have it done when they're in their teenage years. And actually a lot of insurance companies and and healthcare systems would prefer their patients get it done and not have to do the screening every year. So there's a lot of different factors at play. And it seems like the trend in recent years has been toward getting the surgery done earlier and not, not waiting which makes sense, especially if the onset is typically earlier. By getting that preventative surgery, you're really drastically reducing your risk of developing uh, certain cancers. What have, what's been the pattern in your family of when cancers have developed and how has this changed in later generations as we improve healthcare with the information we have and the technology? Well, in our family... Um we had some, uh, my mother had advanced colon cancer diagnosed when she was around 42. And so she kind of fit the pattern of that um, right around age 39. Her own mother, her aunt and uncle also all died in their 30s of colon cancer back in the 1920s and the 1930s. Um, <clears throat> We went with, um, our family was advised to have um, colectomies. So we had part of our colons removed and left, which left about 18 inches. They did not go the J-pouch route at that point in terms of, you know, for preventative measures. And during your childhood, when we were starting to discover more about FAP, um, when did you first go through the genetic testing and counseling this was after you started regular colonoscopies, is that correct? Yes, I did not get a genetic test until I was in my 40s because the APC gene was not discovered um, until around 1991. Um, there was quite the hoopla in the New York Times identifying it um, as, a, as a huge, huge um, advancement towards helping people with this disorder. Uh, I think my first genetic test was in 1999, um, just to rule me out as a carrier. I had always presented without polyps when I went in for my exams with um, 
our, our doctor, uh, Dr. Schultz. He was a colorectal surgeon. He advised all of us kids um, for many years. In fact, he would use us um, as his communication system to get my siblings in there to make sure they were getting their annual colonoscopies on time. And, um, you know, it, it, just, it just worked out. Um, but as time marched on, um, we started to see some other cancers in the family. And um, prior to that, two of my sisters had moved, um, one to Texas and one to John, uh, out to Baltimore. The sister in Texas started, I'm going to use the term doctoring in, uh, at MD Anderson, and my sister, my other sister started doctoring at Johns Hopkins. And that's when I noticed, Kira, that there, was, there were changes going on. I was hearing things like colectomies are not being done anymore for this disease, and we're doing the J-pouch, we're all, you know, ileanal pull-throughs, just words I had never heard before. And I also noticed that my siblings were being asked to undergo upper GI scoping um, using a side viewing scope. And that, um, you know, alarmed me a little bit. And I would ask my mother, I said, why are they having to go look at their stomachs or why do they have to have our stomachs looked at? Um, and she said, well, I don't know, but if they do it and you don't have to worry about it. We don't have to worry about that. So we were just going, always making decisions and coping the best we could with the information that we had. And then around, oh, 2005, 2006, 2007, actually it was 2006, 2007, the family, we had a really long stretch of, you know, quality of life and going through the surveillance process, following the guidelines, living our lives. And um, then it, uh, we were, um, we had a, I had a brother diagnosed with brain cancer and I had a niece diagnosed, a brother, I'm sorry, diagnosed with stomach cancer and a niece diagnosed with brain cancer, literally back to back. We had barely recovered um, from losing our brother when we had to deal with the loss of our niece. And so again, when the cancers show up, when they're diagnosed, what's the pattern? It's, uh, it's been difficult. And with that, just so challenging to have multiple um, cancer diagnoses and be losing family members, um, so hard to really be going through that grief process, but know that other family members are at risk for cancers. And as you said, you were learning that it was more than colon cancer, that there are other different types of cancers that are at a higher risk for those that have FAP. Um, can you speak a little bit about what these other types of cancers are and what their risk level are. are they similar to colon cancer or is it really mostly colon cancer with other types of cancers thrown in there so beyond the colon manifestations of fap there are some benign manifestations and that would include osteomas which are benign tumors that grow in the hard part of bone they're often found in the mandible in the jaw or in the skull um, there are some dental abnormalities there are some changes um, of the retinal pigment in the back of the eye that sometimes, you know, an ophthalmologist or an optometrist can see during a screening exam. And then there are these benign tumors called desmoid tumors, which can grow in the abdomen and pelvis and, and actually through compression can actually cause some problems and often have to be removed surgically. And aside from the those benign manifestations, there's also some um, malignancies that can arise that are not at all related to the colon. It would include an increased risk of thyroid cancer, which thyroid cancer is relatively common in the general population. It's just more common in people with FAP. Um, cancers of the liver, particularly um, a, a subtype called hepatoblastoma, which affects infants, um, manifests in childhood, usually up to around age five. Um, and then there are cancers of the bile ducts and then also of the central nervous system, medulloblastoma being one of them. Um, and there are actually different names given to subtypes um, as they relate to these other extracolonic findings. Gardner syndrome is the term used for, um, you know, FAP plus um, some of these other benign tumors. And it's also related to higher risk of cancers of the small bile stomach uh, and pancreas. And then the other one is Turcot syndrome, which is FAP plus association with medulloblastoma. 
Um, so, you know, from our family's perspective, this went from being uh, a cancer syndrome related to the colon that, you know, once you get your colon taken out, once you get through that big hurdle of having surgery, everything was sort of in the past and you could sort of forget about it. But we sort of learned, you know, through a series of really tragic events that there's more to it and that it really is a, a lifelong cancer syndrome. Um, <clears throat> you know, and to put things into perspective, and everybody eventually would develop cancer if they live forever. Um, it's one of the leading causes of death next to heart disease. But knowing that you're at an increased risk and, and having people so close to you go through these things is just, I think it really rattled a lot of us. And it really kind of became the new, sort of the new paradigm that, that had been haunting us for a long time. And Laura, in your book, you kind of share this process and going from thinking it was really just the colon that you, your family needed to focus on to learning about these other cancers and researching all of this. How much research have you done and went into writing Summer's Complaint? Well, um, to be honest with you, most of the research um, I had had done when I was a kid because I tended to be kind of nosy and pushy around adults and uh, over the top curious. And I always like to sit and listen to my great aunt, um, my two great aunts actually, and my mother talking about the family up in Devil's Lake, North Dakota, and Summer's Complaint. And um, I used to rifle through some papers I probably shouldn't have been looking at at a young age. Um, looking at death certificates and letters um, exchanged by loved ones, um, um, also bringing up um, the sickness that their sibling um, was dealing with. And um, on top of that, uh, it was just the medical information of the history of FAP, which I spent a little bit more time on. I found I was very curious about it, where it came from and what was happening when. And I sort of tried to align that with what our family was learning around the same time. We learned about this disease and the progression of this disease and how to live with this disease along, along the way with the doctors and scientists and researchers who were trying to figure out as, as well. So the, the book is really a the narrative that, that brings the research, our family history, including all the documents and the storytelling, into what I hope is a compelling, engaging story for readers. It, it definitely is. A, I was able to read the book before this interview, and I have, I have to compliment you. You do a fantastic job in taking all of this medical information, which can be dense, and there's a lot that goes into this syndrome, but weaving it in with your family story so that, you know, readers can really get a glimpse into your life and everything and be able to learn a little bit about the terminology and the elevated cancer risks and the different preventative surgeries that go along with this. I did want to uh, give you an opportunity to explain the title of your book and kind of what that means. Well, summer, summer's complaint is a term that was tossed around again, at the kitchen table and in conversations that uh, the family members were having all the way back to 1911, when my great-grandmother, Mary Reagan Baker, was most likely the first FAP diagnosed at Mayo um, in Rochester. And so I heard the term summer's complaint, and my paternal grandmother explained that um, there was, or there is a there was a diagnosis um, called summer complaint, and usually it applied to children and infants who got gastrointestinal disturbances. They were lethargic, uh, vomiting, diarrhea, and it tended to happen in the summer when milk would be spoiled or food would be left out. Um, and so the doctors up in North Dakota, it, if you had those kinds of intestinal systems, it was they called it summer complaint. Somehow, we changed it along the way in the family folk folklore to Summer's Complaint. And everyone in my family, um, even my, my children and adults um, and some of the people we still have in our lives living up in North Dakota, you, you say Summer's Complaint and everybody knows what you're talking about. So when I sat down to read it, I thought there was only one title this book can have in that summer's complaint. And when I ran that past my siblings and some of the, the relatives, um, 
they said it's perfect. It can't be called anything else but that. And I think you kind of get a sense of that. Um, once you read the book, you're like, this This really fits. You know, it's, it's about your, your family, but it's also kind of um, showing what the syndrome is that your family um, is affected by and everything. I do want to end the show with asking if you have any advice to others that have a strong family history of cancers or have been recently diagnosed and are joining the community. Well, I, um, I would say that uh, it's really important to know the details of your family's health history uh, by talking to your family members and using some of the great online tools they have available now. I, um, I actually had a really crude little drawing of a family pedigree chart that was embarrassing and on paper I probably pulled out of a college notebook. But it, it, uh, it came in handy when I was talking with doctors or I had to change doctors and say, look, this is my family, this is what we have. This is what I know about it. Um, I would also suggest if um, a family or an individual is dealing with something that might be running in their family to have genetic testing and please see once you get those results and before you have the test, please see a professional genetic counselor. I did not have the opportunity to see sit down with a genetic counselor until I had my test run, one in, again, 1999 and again in 2007 because we were so, um, you know, with, the, with these other cancers showing up, we were just terrified. And to sit down with a genetic counselor prior to the test and after the test, it really helps. It gives you, you know, that protected time with someone that you can just pour out all your anxieties. And I wish I would have had that when I was a child and as a teenager, but, you know, it, it just wasn't meant to be. But I've since um, developed, uh, my family has a very close relationship with the Masonic Cancer Clinic at the University of Minnesota and the genetics department. And they've had, they've been wonderful. They've been really, really helpful in helping us cope and, and get through all this. I'd also say find doctors who are well-versed in your disease, um, get second opinions as needed, get acquainted with the many resources patients have available to them, including online and, and even through social media. Um, but really advocate on behalf of yourself as a patient and for your loved ones because things happen, records get lost, systems don't talk to each other. Um, and so, again, you have to be kind of your best advocate. And also think about joining a patient registry and participating in clinical trials. Um, one of the disappointments I've had with my own family is we were never able to join a patient registry at one location so that people could really study us as a very large group. And I think that that's unfortunate. And for those that do want to look for a genetic counselor, because I do also highly recommend that. That's what I'm going to school for. So I'm a little biased. Oh, good but for you. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll, I'll be in the workforce in a few years. But you can go to findageneticcounselor.com to find one near you or through the phone. Um, definitely highly recommend that, especially if you have a family history of something. Um, we say that the best genetic test really is uh, family health history. So, you know, when you're with family or, you know, pick up the phone and call them just to be able to really explore your family history and be knowledgeable of that. I think um, you guys have shown just how important that is um, in different families. And I really want to thank both of you for coming on the show and sharing your experience and your family history, um, as well as, you know, your perspective as a doctor, Alex. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you, Kira. And I do want to let you guys know that you can go to laurakeeger.com for more information um, about the family and her book. Um, if you want to directly buy the book, you can go to Amazon and just search Summer's Complaint. Do want to give a shout out to the recording studio that we used in Chicago, CRC, uh, in Chicago. So if you're looking for a recording studio, check them out. And all of this information that we talked about today, um, I know we kind of threw out a lot of medical terms and things. You can go to dnapodcast.com and all the information and the links that we mentioned are going to be there. If you're on Instagram, you can follow me at DNA Radio, Twitter at DNA Podcast, and any questions for the three of us can be sent into info at dnapodcast.com. So thanks for listening, guys, and join me next week to learn and discover new advances in the world of genetics. The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. We're all made of.